In a previous series of tutorials, I explained how to use Adobe Illustrator to do a portrait. The shading techniques I used worked well for faces that are all one color, but are problematic when trying to render faces that have tattoos or face paint. In this video, I'll share a different technique that addresses that specific issue. I won't be explaining every detail of the process of doing the illustration. If you want step-by-step -step instructions on how to do eyes from start to finish, for example, please watch my series Adobe Illustrator Portraits, parts 1 through 5. I will, however, show you a new iris color technique, as well as demonstrating how to use the 3D and materials feature, some highlight tricks using the gradient tool, and an example of how I use the gradient mesh tool, in addition to the new shading technique. Let's get started. Briefly, this is how the same color skin tone shading system works. Begin with the outline of the face filled with color. I call this the base shape. Create a second shape that will be the basis for the shading. I call this the big blend shape. It will be the same color as the base shape and it will have no stroke color. Shape to shape blends work best when the two shapes being blended have the same number of points. The best way to accomplish this is to copy the big blend shape, command C, paste in front, command F, and then use the direct selection tool to adjust the copied shape to make it smaller. I call this the small blend shape. When we're finished, we will have the base shape on the bottom, the big blend shape on top of that, and the small blend shape at the very top of the stack of three shapes. The small blend shape is the one that will be the darker color. Select only the big and small blend shapes and go to Object, Blend, Make, choosing Smooth Color as the blending format. The farther apart the points are, the more gradual the blend. To create a highlight coming up out of the shadow, draw the big blend shape, duplicate it, and make the small blend shape. The big blend shape will be the same color as the shadow. The small blend shape will be the color of the highlight. Blend them together as before. As long as the skin tone is the same color, this technique works fine. When we have a situation where the face has multiple colors, this technique doesn't work because there's no one base color we can blend to. The way to get around this is to blend from black to white rather than from base color to shadow. Using the white direct selection tool to access each shape individually, we change the small blend shape to black and the big blend shape to white. Then deselect and reselect using the black selection tool to activate both shapes blended together. Use the transparency palette to change the blend mode from normal to multiply. We see that where it's black, it doesn't show through at all, and where it's white, it shows through completely, with the grays in between showing more or less of the pattern underneath. To get the whole blend to be lighter, simply change the opacity of the combined blend to something less than 100%. Let's talk now about how to do highlights, because it's a different and more involved process. Instead of blending black to white, we blend white to white. Illustrator won't let us blend to transparent or no color at all using smooth color. If we make the big blend shape 0% transparency and blend it to the 100% opaque small blend shape, the result is a funny one-step blend that isn't what we want. The way to get around this situation is to blend the two 100% opacity shapes together, but in a slightly different way. Go to Object, Blend, but before doing the final blend, choose Blend Options and then Specified Steps instead of Smooth Color. Set the number of steps fairly high at around 200, then blend the two shapes together. I don't know why this works. I never read this anywhere. I just figured it out on my own. With the Direct Selection tool, make the big blend shape active and change the opacity to 0%. The blend now acts the way that we want it to. Note that we don't have to change the blend mode for this to work. The default normal mode works just fine. 
Selecting the whole blend with the black selection tool will allow us to make the highlight less bright if we so choose. We can have highlight blends sitting on top of shadow blends, but I think that results in a highlight that's a little muddy. You may be okay with that, especially when I show you a rather complicated and potentially confusing way to get around the issue. Here we have two separate circles that overlap each other, and they're the same color. What we want to do is make these two shapes into one shape that has an inside and an outside, like a donut. Grouping the two shapes together won't work. Instead, we select both shapes and go to Object, Compound Path, Make. It's now one compound shape with a hole in it. To blend this from light to dark, we copy it, paste in front, and use the white direct selection tool to start moving points to create the small blend shape. Notice that we have to move both the inside and the outside points. I'll jump to the finish because watching me do this is boring. So now we have the two compound shapes with the smaller shape on top. The bigger shape will be the lighter color, the smaller shape the darker color. When we blend them together, the result is a shadow with a hole in it where we can then place a highlight. Here's how it works in the simple face example. The big blend shape is already drawn. Draw the shape that's going to be the hole. Select both shapes and go to Object, Compound Path, Make to create one compound shape that has two parts, inside and outside. As with the donut example, make a copy of this compound shape and move the points in to create the small blend shape before blending the big and small shapes together. Now this is something that you either get or you don't get. If you don't get it or do something wrong, I can't explain to you in the comment section why it's not working. I'm not being callous, it's just that I would have to watch what you did to see where the problem is, and obviously I can't do that in this teaching environment. Now let's talk about how to apply these techniques to an actual portrait. I'm not going to demonstrate every step-by-step -step detail of how I created this illustration. Again, if that's what you're looking for, I recommend you watch my previous series, which covered all the details of how to do eyes, lips, eyebrows, hair, that sort of thing. Don't flame me in the comments because you don't want to be bothered with watching another video. These tutorials are very time-consuming to do. If I'm willing to share my knowledge and experience with you for free, the least you can do is invest a few hours of your time without complaining so that you can more quickly master the skills it's taken me a lifetime to learn. A well-lit, detailed, high-resolution reference photo is critical to the success of a project like this. I either take the photo myself or find a stock image that features what is called Rembrandt lighting. Illumination comes from either the left or the right, with one side of the face in light and the opposite side in shadow, with the exception of a triangle-shaped highlight on the cheek. What I do is take the reference image into Photoshop, where I use levels to lighten up a copy of the photo. The reason I do this is to help you see details in the shadows of the eyes or the hair. Since I'm not using the reference photo in this instance to determine color, but only values, I also made a copy and converted it to grayscale. Each of the three images were imported into Illustrator, lined up exactly, and placed on separate layers. This will be important later on when I show you how to use gradient mesh to render the shading for the chest and shoulders. Unfortunately, I can't give you specific instructions for how to shade your particular portrait, but frontal or three-quarter view illustrations typically have similar solutions, so I hope you find this example helpful. I caution you that this is not a beginner technique. If you aren't already proficient with the pen tool, you'll have difficulty duplicating these results. Even with good pen tool skills, this takes a lot of time to do. There are no shortcuts, so give yourself some grace and keep working at it. It's the only way to improve. For best results, the majority of the initial shading should be created using one large shadow rather than a number of smaller disconnected shadows. I'm not going to worry about real subtle details. You can get yourself in trouble trying to render every little thing. In general, I see a forehead plate right here, then a plate on the side that goes back 
at a bit of an angle with the transition from one plate to another being fairly gradual. Starting with a pen path down the forehead about right here, turning to the left as the line hits the ridge of the eyebrow, down the bridge of the nose like so, around the ball at the tip of the nose, to the bottom left edge of the nostril, down under the lips, circling around the protrusion of the chin, then up the jawline into the hair, and back around to complete the shape. The triangle highlight on the cheek needs to be drawn as well, and then made into a compound path. This compound path, filled with white, will be duplicated and adjusted to create the small blend shape, which will be filled with black. The two shapes are then smooth color blended together and set to multiply. Notice that the distance between the two sets of lines is greater at the forehead and the cheek, making gradients that take longer to go from white to black. The distance between the two lines is much closer on the bridge of the nose because the curve there is so much more abrupt than the curve of the forehead. For the sake of clarity, here are the shapes rendered in just lines on a white background, and here are the shapes filled with outlines and blended together. The opacity is set to 65%. Note that shape-to-shape -shape blends must never include strokes, only fills. Usually, one shadow isn't going to be enough. The deeper shadows around the eye, the side of the nose, and the side of the face will require another compound path, black to white blend set to multiply. These shapes are starting to get more complex and detailed, especially around the bottom of the nose. This level of complexity may be too much for you to try on your first portrait. I know you don't want to hear this, but each portrait you do will be better than the last one. I've done at least 40 or 50 of these, so you shouldn't expect to get the same kind of results that I do unless you have a similar level of experience. Here's what the line work looks like apart from the reference photo, and here's what the blend looks like. We can see the lighter first shadow combined with the multiplied second shadow laying on top, which creates richer, deeper shading in some areas. There also needs to be somewhat lighter shading on the left side. The technique is the same with a compound shape to allow for the highlight on the outside edge of the eye socket just under the eyebrow. As before, here's just the shapes on white and here are the shapes blended together and set to an opacity of 25% and a blend mode of multiply. When all three blend shapes are added together, we can really see the forms of the face starting to come together. I could stop here, but I think one more shadow layer is needed. These shapes will represent the darkest shadows around the eyes and will help the eye color to pop with a nice light, dark contrast. Unfortunately, by this point, all these lines are becoming really complex, and I don't blame you if you get overwhelmed. This is the reason I showed them to you one at a time, rather than all at once. Here's all the line work and here's all the shading stacked and multiplied. The next step in the process will be to draw an outline of the face that's on a layer under the shading and highlight layers in the stacking order. This is where the real versatility of the shading technique becomes apparent. It only takes a moment to change the color or even add a pattern to this lower layer to change the color of the face without having to redo any blends or highlights. To create the shading on the neck and chest, we'll use gradient mesh. Here's a quick overview of how it works. I like to start with the rectangle, which will be filled up with whatever the current foreground color is. From there, go to Object, Gradient Mesh, which leads to this dialog box. I personally like to start with fewer mesh points. Currently, all these different points are filled up, quote unquote, with the foreground color. But if we use the direct selection tool and access just one of them, we can change the color to something different than the others. Each of these mesh points has a set of one, two, three, four handles. And we can use these handles to control the blend from one point to another. Making this handle shorter results in the orange moving higher. Moving this handle results in the blend from orange to purple happening faster. The closer the handles, the more abrupt the transition will be. 
We can also move the handle left or right, sort of like the pen tool, where we see that the color blend has shifted from left over more to the right. We can assign pretty much any color that we want, which allows us to do some things that might otherwise be more difficult to do with shape-to-shape -shape blends. We can move the mesh points themselves as well. Let's go into the wireframe to see this a little better. If, for example, we want shading that will follow along the line of the collarbone, we use the Direct Selection tool to modify both the points and the handles to get the flow of the shading to go in the direction we want. Switching to the preview mode, we can then hold down the shift key and select multiple points and apply a new color to them all at the same time. If we decide that this gradation is too gradual, the mesh tool in the tool palette allows us to add another set of points by clicking right on an existing line. Holding down the shift key allows us to select just these new points and assign a new color. In this case, I want the same purple, so clicking on an existing purple color point with the eyedropper tool assigns that color to the new points. Because the lines are closer together, the gradation happens quicker. If we decide it's too close, we can always move them up. To use a photo to sample color from, the photo needs to be on a lower layer and the mesh needs to be on an upper layer. We don't want the eyedropper to be too sensitive, so double click on the tool and change from a point sample to a 5x5 five five average. Sample a color from the photo that is about the overall average, then draw a rectangle. We want to be able to sample the colors of the photo underneath, but we can't as long as we're in preview mode. Hold down the command key and click on the eye icon for the mesh layer of the layers palette, which changes it to outline view while leaving the photo on preview mode. Next, object gradient mesh. Remember, in the beginning, fewer mesh points are better. We can always add more later. Since the position of the mesh lines added later are based on the position of the existing mesh line, it's important to get the first few positions just right. It's also important when moving the mesh points not to have the ends of the handles overlap, which would create a very abrupt transition. We're seeing a gradation from here to about here, so we probably want to add another mesh point about right there and maybe another one about right here. Now, use the Direct Selection tool to highlight just one mesh point. While this one point is active, switch to the eyedropper and sample the color just to the side of the mesh point. What's happening is the specific color we sampled is applied to the active mesh point. Holding down the Command key accesses the White Selection tool to highlight the next point. Letting go of the Command key gets us back to the eyedropper so that we can sample again. Repeat this process until all the mesh points have been assigned colors from the sampled reference photo. This can be a tedious process, and we want to be careful where we click. Don't click right on a mesh point, or it will apply the same color it already has. When finished, we have a pretty good approximation of the collarbone area. We've got good horizontal coverage, but some vertical sampling is also necessary. I want to add more mesh points, but notice if we don't click right on an existing line, we won't get a new set of points. A new mesh point set on the left will let us represent this shadow as it starts to fade out. Another session of sampling helps to refine the illustration. Be careful though, too many mesh points can result in patchy blending. Some people use this technique to do the whole illustration. I've done a few that way, and with enough patience and skill, it can actually wind up looking exactly like the reference photo. But why would you want to do that? Why not just use the reference photo and save yourself a lot of time and effort? Since we're only looking for value references, the grayscale version of the reference photo is the one we'll be sampling. Some people will start by drawing the shape the way they want it to end up. I find the mesh lines start out pretty wonky that way. I start with a rectangle and then adjust the outside shape later to the approximate final outline using the clipping mask to finish it off cleanly. Here's the finished mesh. 
I'm not worrying about whether the edges follow the top of the shoulders or not. It's just easier to draw the shoulder shape separately, bring it to the front, object, arrange, bring to front, select both the top shape and the mesh shading, and then object, clipping mask, make. Anytime I'm trying to render subtle, gradual shading that doesn't have too many twists and turns to it, gradient mesh is going to be a good option. Something like the nose, with lots of different surface planes and tight spacing, is very difficult to pull off the gradient mesh. At least for me, shape-to-shape -shape blends is a better option there. I find that sometimes my shape-to-shape -shape blends show some banding that I don't really like. As much as I've experimented with getting the blends to be smoother, I've never found a technique that works well for me. What I do instead is to put a subtle texture on top of it to try and diffuse the banding effect. This also serves to mimic the look of the skin's pores. Start with a copy of the face, base, and neck color and fill it up with a texture, which are found under Window, Swatch Libraries, Patterns, Basic Graphics, Textures. The more biomorphic looking ones tend to work best. We can use the scale tool to change the size of the pattern while leaving the size of the shape untouched. Apply a Gaussian blur. The higher the number, the greater the blur. Set the transparency pretty low and as usual, set the blend mode to multiply. This texture sitting on top of the shape-to-shape -shape blends is going to serve to minimize the banding. Blending shape-to-shape -to, -shape to render a highlight this small is kind of a pain to do. Let me show you a technique that works well and can have applications in other areas. Create a white stroke with rounded corners and use the Width tool to make a section thicker, which I've already showed you how to do. Assign a gradient to the path, not the fill. Double click on the right side color well and change the black to white. Notice that we can change the opacity of these gradation points as well as their color. Set both the left and right sides to 20% opacity. Then click just under the gradation indicator to create a third color well, which will assign the opacity of 100%. Adding a fourth color well allows us to control the width of the 100% white section by moving either of them left or right. Adding a Gaussian blur will make the edges softer. If we decide the highlight is too hot, we can just change the percentages to something less than 100%. If you try this technique and your results are pixelated, you need to go to Effect Document Raster Settings and change the default 72 pixels per inch screen resolution to 300 pixels. See how much nicer it looks now. Anytime a Gaussian blur is looking pixelated, this is probably going to be the solution. Speaking of Gaussian blurs, let me mention something that sometimes comes up in my on-ground classes. A student who isn't very good with the pen tool will draw a shape like this to represent the highlight on the cheek rather than doing a proper shape-to-shape -shape blend. They will then blur the heck out of it. This seems like a really easy solution, but the problem is that Gaussian blurs soften all the edges the same amount. When we do a shape-to-shape -shape blend, we can control how quickly each edge blends independently from the other edges, which is what we want. The highlight blends quicker up towards the edge of the eye socket and much more slowly as it blends down towards the chin. If you use the Gaussian blur as a crutch to do highlights, your portrait will look mushy with ill-defined facial features. It's your portrait, do what you want, but I don't recommend taking this easy way out. In my previous tutorial series, I spent a whole step-by-step -step video showing how to do the eyes, and all that information is still valid. So if you haven't already watched it, you might want to do so, because I'm not going to repeat it all here. What I want to show you now is a new technique for getting really nice complex coloring in the iris. 
This is the coloring I created for the eyes in this video. Let me show you how to create your own amazing iris colors. Here's the iris isolated from the rest of the eye and then the pattern that was used to create the base iris color. First, draw a circle. Go to Window, then all the way down to Brush Libraries and choose Bristle Brushes. The thickness of the stroke will depend on how big the initial circle is. It's worth experimenting to see which one you like. For me, this one will work best because the stroke is also filling up the interior of the circle. There's lots of lines and overlapping values, which is just what we want. Go to Object, Expand Appearance, and switch to the Outline view to see all the complex shapes. Under the Width tool are a number of other tools designed to distort shapes in various ways. The one we will be using is Scallop. This circle indicates the area of influence, and this value can be changed by double-clicking on the tool to access its Options palette. Changing the numbers here makes for a bigger area of influence. A quick click on the shape gives us this result. It's OK, but a tighter area of influence produces a more satisfactory result. In the preview mode, it looks like this. This is a great start, but we want even more complexity. Now, I had to turn off Show Edges so that we can see this better, but normally this is what we would see. If you ever do this, you need to remember to turn it back on when you're finished. To give this shape even more complexity, go to Effect, Distort and Transform, Roughen. The Roughen dialog box allows us to add more twists and turns, which are doing some very interesting things to our base iris color. To make this change permanent, go to Object, Expand Appearance. Because the color in this shape is somewhat transparent, layering on other colors can have some very cool effects. Using the Rotate tool to copy and offset the new shape, change the color of the copy slightly. Make a third rotated copy and change that one to purple. Continue this process until the desired result is achieved. I like the pattern that I'm seeing, but I'm not sure I'm in love with these colors. Illustrator gives us a way to change the colors pretty painlessly. Drag to select all the shapes. Go to Edit, Edit Colors, Recolor Artwork. This gets us to a very cool tool. Watch what happens as I drag this large circle around the color wheel. The colors change in preview in real time without me having to do everything all over again. Let's say we're going for a demon eyes look. With this iris color as a base and using the step-by-step -step eye tutorial movie instruction results in a rather nice looking eye. Let me show you how I created the face paint, tribal markings, and jewelry. Feel free to tune out if that's not of interest to you. Under the Line Segment tool is the Spiral tool, which does a great job of creating golden ratio spirals, also known as Fibonacci spirals. Make the line thicker, adding a rounded end cap in the Options area of the Stroke palette. Select the Width tool, position it right on the spiral line, and drag out to make some parts of the path thicker than other parts. Switching to the Outline view tells us that this line is still editable, so if we decide to come back and make it thicker still, we have that option. We also have the option to make it thinner. To set the changes, go to Object, Expand Appearance, which converts the spiral line into a shape as if we had drawn it with the Pen tool. At this point, the shape looks like it's sitting on a flat surface rather than a curved one, like a cheek which will distort the shape somewhat. One of the ways to create the necessary distortion is to go to Object, Envelope Distort, Make with Mesh. The number of vertices can be as many as we want, but I think three in each direction will be fine. With the White Direct Selection tool, each vertice can be independently manipulated, which in turn causes the shape to deform. This is a much more effective way to get the final shape than it would be to try and draw the distortions into the shape from the beginning.
Facial coloring, that can be Native American, for example, or perhaps like that of Thanos henchwoman Proxima Midnight, can be accomplished this way. This is not a brand new blending technique. It's actually the same as what we did with the white to white blended highlights. This is a small blend shape on top of a large blend shape, both being the same color red, set to blend by specified steps with a fairly high number of steps. Once the blend is made, select the big blend shape with the white direct selection tool and change the opacity to zero, leaving the blend mode set to normal, which results in a gradual blending from red to green. Again, I remind you that this technique doesn't work with smooth color blends, only specified steps. Keeping with the MCU theme, if we wanted to have some Thor the Gladiator style face paint, this is how I would do it. This technique has just tons of applications. We start by drawing a line with no fill color. Now, use the brush palette to apply one of these custom strokes to the line. If we want to make the custom stroke thicker, simply increase the line weight. If we don't like the curve of the stroke, we can edit it just like we would a pen tool path, which in fact it still is. Window, brush libraries, gives us access to a number of prefabricated line styles. Once the shape is exactly how we want it, we can expand the appearance and give it a color or leave it in a form that can be edited later. Illustrator is not nearly as robust as a dedicated 3D program like Adobe Dimensions, but we can still get some pretty nice shapes and surface textures out of it. The first thing we want to do is to create this repeated pattern and bend it into the curve of the necklace. Start with this basic pattern element, select it with the black selection tool, and drag to the right while holding down the Option key and the Shift key to make a copy that lines up exactly horizontal to the original shape. With the copy still selected, hold down the Command key and push down the D key repeatedly to make a series of evenly spaced shapes that, when finished, will look like a chain. Select the whole series of shapes and drag them into the brushes palette. In the dialog box, choose Art Brush, then click OK. Give this new custom brush a name. Uh, scale proportionally means that the stroke will increase or decrease proportionally depending on the length of the line it is being applied to. Stretch to fit means the stroke will squish down and fatten when applied to a short line or elongate and thin out when applied to a long line. Use the ellipse tool to create an oval and delete the top half. This will be the path of the necklace. We'll use this path again later, so option drag to make a copy. Make the copy 12 points wide with rounded end caps. With the first curved path selected, click on the newly created chain path. The brush shape is applied to the path. At this point, we can still change the shape of the path, but as it's just what we want, expand the appearance to convert the path into a shape. With the expanded palette selected, go to Effect, 3D and Materials, Inflate. It's not going to look like much while the surface color is black, so click on Materials in the 3D palette and scroll down to Gold Natural. Click on Lighting and choose the top left option, which most closely matches the lighting in our reference photo. Select the thicker curved line and apply the same 3D and materials characteristics. Drag the chain shape down onto the necklace base shape, making sure it's on top. This technique doesn't create cast shadows, so let's fake some with a copy of the shape filled with black. Soften the edges with Gaussian Blur, lower the opacity to 45%, and set the blend mode to multiply. For the pendant, use the spiral and width tools as we did with the tribal face markings, and draw a thick circle around it. We're going to use the Pathfinder to make this into one shape, and for that to work, both objects need to be shapes, not stroked paths. This is why I often expand the appearance rather than leaving them as paths. With all the shapes selected, open the Pathfinder palette and click Unite, which makes the selected objects into one shape. 
apply the same gold 3D and materials attributes as before. If you stuck with me to the end of the video, thanks so much for watching. I hope you found the information I shared worth your time. Feel free to ask questions in the comments section if I have been in any way unclear in my explanations. I'll do my best to get back to you as time allows. I probably should have said so in the beginning, but I work on a Mac, so if your question is PC specific, I may not be able to help you. I'd love to see the illustrations you do based on what you learn. You can send them to me at my Palm Beach Atlantic University email address, which is david underscore pounds at pba.edu.